So first of all, good morning. It's great to be here. Great to see so many familiar faces here. Um, yeah, maybe the technical thing might be arranged, but anyway, let's start. So what I have uh, prepared for you is a, yeah, a brief agenda. So first of all, I would like to, uh, to give you a brief introduction um, of um, who we are, what we do, and uh, about myself. Um, then I would like to walk you through the theoretical aspects of the dry processing, linking over to the experience that, that we gained in the last years. And then I will leave you with some take-home messages, and I'm happy to answer your uh, questions. So, starting with the introduction. So, a few words about myself. Um, so, I'm coming from Infield. So, I have a background in, um, in process engineering, mechanical engineering, and um, project management. And uh, I'm the CTO of Reinhardt. And um, so, I'm working in this position um, or working at Reinhardt for almost 10 years now. And um, I am busy with the insects um, since almost eight years right now. So a few words about Reinhardt. Reinhardt is a relatively old company. We have a long history. Um, we were founded over 160 years ago. And our main field of activity is uh, the vegetable oil um, industry. And there we are active in a cold pressing. So this cold pressing technology was also the, um, the door opener for the insect industry because this technology could be easily adapted for defatting of insects. And that was quite helpful at this point. So going through the points that uh, we are able to provide, so on one hand, obviously, we can provide equipment for the dry processing. But on the other hand, in the last years, we were able to gain a lot of um, experience in other areas. So therefore, we are happy to, to run engineering projects on our own or together with our partners, do consulting. And on the other hand, we are also active in networking. So what do I mean by networking? So since we are doing this since a while, we have a good network of companies which are um, act, um, yeah, able to do things, and therefore we are happy to link these companies together in the benefit of the um, industry. So this chart shows you how simple it is. So here it is linked to BSF, but we can um, use that for mealworm, silkworm, fruit flies, um, crickets, all other type of insects. So the two steps that we hear is we have the live larvae. We do a drying. And from the drying step, we go into defatting. So while the drying, we are also taking care of the deactivation um, of the insects in line with the animal welfare. And then we have two products. We have the insect meal and we have the, the insect fat. So the insect fat needs some purification. Actually, that's it. So this is what we see as a big uh, benefit. It's relatively simple. Um, so. One important point in this entire uh, process is the drying technology. So the dryer itself, it has a relatively big footprint. It can be very intense in capex and opex. So therefore, the drying technology has to be picked uh, very carefully. So the good thing is that the drying technology that we are using is a well-known and well-established technology that can be simply adapted for the individual cases. And on the other hand, we have to implement this concept in the overall um, heat balance of the facility. So I will explain that in detail a bit later. So we classify the dryers uh, in two categories mainly. So um, on one hand, we have the typical air dryers. Air dryers uh, could be fluid bed dryer. It can be, can be drum dryers. It can be drying chambers like used in most of the uh, pilot facilities. You might ask yourself, why don't we have a, a belt dryer uh, here? Well, the belt dryer, unfortunately, is not uh, mixing the insects properly, so therefore the, um, the drying itself uh, is a bit more tricky. Um, so the characteristics of this type of dryer is that uh, we are, in, in comparison to, uh, to contact drying, we are uh, relatively high in, in OPEX. So we typically measure this, how many kilowatts do we have to put in there to evaporate one kilogram of water. On the other hand, we are in good control of the um, temperatures. And in most of the facilities, in some kinds, we see this technology as a state of the art, at least for the small and middle scale facilities that we are having right now. So when it comes to bigger facilities, that might change a bit. So what I have uh, implemented here for you on one hand is a, is a video from a fluid bed dryer. So in that case, that, um, that's a batch one. 
And on the other hand, I have um, implemented a diagram which nicely shows uh, how the drying process um, behaves. So we start with a linear decrease of the moisture. Typically, we also start with a high air temperature. And the point we would like to make here is that uh, there are still big question marks on how the temperature actually um, influences the protein quality. So what we learned from, from the last years that the te temperature definitely has an impact, but in most of the cases we are um, overrating the impact. There are a few things that we have to take into this consideration. It's uh, quite uh, scientific and we, hopefully there will be more studies in the future that when we um, operate with high temperatures, um, it is uh, the, the protein inside the, the larvae or the meal it is more or less conserved with water and fat. So at the beginning, when we work with high temperatures, almost nothing happens. So the lower we go, the more impact we will see. And what we, uh, um, yeah, what we found in mainly the last um, studies that we did internally, that if we start to overdry, then we see a huge difference. So um, to give you some numbers, we are uh, when we gently air dried product, we are speaking of digestibilities of 80-90%. So these are typical numbers that we get. If we overdry product, we reduce it down to 40-50%. So when we reach a critical point, it really starts to impact the product. So therefore, we have to uh, carefully pick the, the drying technology and the temperature. So beside the air drying, we have the, the contact drying. So this can, these can be disc dryers, can be batch cookers. Um, so characteristics there, they, they are having a smaller footprint in general, so um, um, taking out things like um, heat recuperation from the air drying, normally they are a bit cheaper and they are less in OPEX. Uh, they can be operated under atmospheric pressure and under vacuum, so the benefit actually is that if we have a product that are um, um, sensitive to oxidation, working with contact dryers, especially under vacuum, uh, can be very interesting. And what we see is that these type of dryers are coming, uh, coming up more and more um, as they are also standard in animal byproduct rendering. So we think that this technology uh, might be seen a bit uh, fre more frequently in the future. So after the drying, uh, what we need to do is to take out the fat. So this can be done with, uh, with screw presses. So the videos you see here was uh, taken from, from installation in Asia. So the good thing is we're also working with well-known uh, technology. Uh, by reducing the fat, we increase the shelf time. We also strongly increase uh, the protein content. And with, with this type of um, setup, it is uh, possible, obviously depending on what kind of default number we are having, to increase the protein above 60%. So there are some peaks of 70%, but this is, this is really rare. Um, so, and um, sticking to the topic of theoretical aspects, so after the block diagram, typically we go ahead with the, with the process flow diagram displaying all the streams, all the temperatures, etc. So I would not bother you with all the numbers. So now coming to the um, most important points, so what, what are our learnings from the last years? So the typical pain points that, that we see is uh, the first question of uh, the customers, okay, well, do we go for wet or do we go for dry rendering? So first of all, the point we would like to make here is that it's good that we have two solid technologies available and depending on what, uh, what are the needs, uh, these technologies, they can, be, uh, they can be picked. So this can be done by evaluation matrix. In most of the cases, it's also it's a kind of personal preferences. So if someone used to work with wet rendering, he's more addicted to go for a wet process and the other way around. So the drying technology is uh, also critical, as I mentioned. So there we have to very carefully pick what, what to do. Another thing is how do we synchronize the rearing? So there the automation comes into play. Are we really able to, to empty all the crates, all the um, trays that, that we have in a, um, in a correct matter so we have a stable flow of insect? Because this technology, we, we are not uh, speaking of having a silo of product and we just simply discharge. Unfortunately, it's not that easy. So, um, so then the quality aspect comes in. So um, here we have to, first of all, define what do we mean by quality? Are we speaking of digestibility? Are we speaking of protein content? Are we speaking of shelf time, color, smell? So this is something that is, um, in most of the cases, it's not defined, unfortunately. 
And then, of course, we have to see, okay, if we scale up, how do we scale it up? Do we multiply it? Uh, is it uh, do we have enough spare in this machinery? So from the pain points coming to the trends, so minding the time, I would just go through the main uh, trends that we see, or the general trends, that um, in the last years we have seen more and more decentralized plants and middle-scale plants. So um, there are a few big installations upcoming, but uh, we see that there is a trend going to smaller units. And also linked to this trend, we see um, a need for separating uh, the individual sections. So means uh, the, uh, the breeding, the rearing and the processing. So luckily, more and more companies are coming up which are actually able to provide X neonates in order to, to reduce the complexity at this point. So speaking in terms of project management, this is a, a good way of reducing the risk by uh, giving it to specialized uh, parties. So, and where do these uh, trends and uh, pain points come from? They actually come from in-field um, projects. So what we learned from most of these projects is that um, unfortunately there is no standard yet. So standardization will definitely help the industry to reduce the costs. We are not there yet, but the more players we will have on the market, the closer we will get to that. And this will make the product more cost efficient and will help the industry in general. But there is at least a little light at the end of a tunnel for pilot facilities. There are already some things available that can be, um, yeah, that can be fit in a kind of standard. For example, um, a processing unit which can um, defat cricket, mealworms, BSF, and um, fat filtration units. So, and coming to the end, a quick summary and take-home message. So, um, as I mentioned. Um, all these installations, they really need to be customized. So unfortunately, we haven't met a single project where we just could copy and paste what we did before. So we have to understand the needs and we have to adapt the technology that we have. On the other hand, we see unfortunately a trend to making things more complicated than they actually are. So facilities like that, they can grow in an organic way. So we do not necessarily need to implement um, artificial intelligence from the first stage. We don't have to um, directly go for the full automation. We can start with a half, a half automation and while we are ramping up, um, adapting that. Another point is the, the ramp up. Um, so we see this as a critical point. So from our experience, this is um, highly underrated, means that equipment that is ordered um, is way too big and it takes a while till you are there. So if you don't press the button and the biology is there, the rearing is there, it takes some time. And I'm not speaking of days, I'm speaking of months or even years. So therefore, this, this has to be um, in line with the uh, technology. Uh, then we need to see that the interface is not only the heat balance between um, breeding, rearing and processing is critical. So we can use exhaust heat coming from, from drying technology in some other areas. Um, we have to be aware that some problems in the breeding will um, immediately influence the processing. So then we need to have a bigger awareness for that. And what we also see that well-known technology like drying technology, the wet process, uh, the screw press themselves, they are evolving very quickly and adapting to the needs. So this is, this is good. So therefore, I hope I was able to uh, leave you with some messages and um, now I'm happy to answer your question. Many thanks. I'm Antti Vasala from Entoprot. So um, you shortly mentioned the possibility of decentralized production. Now, uh, in practice, it would mean that the producer should take care of drying of the stuff, which then will be delivered to the uh, downstream processing plant. How about the possibility to just collect fresh uh, larvae, having them a little bit chilled or, well, they are very robust animals, so I, I believe they would tolerate quite well transportation to a real factory. So, uh, have you thought about this? Have you experienced? Uh, have any of your partners presented this, this idea to you? No. 
So this is a great question. So when it comes to decentralized plans, we exactly have to answer this, this question. So I'm a bit skeptic when it comes to transportation of uh, live animals. So as w during the transport, we, we cannot make sure that, that we um, um, yeah, arrange for the animal welfare. On the other hand, if we use um, technologies like freezing, vacuuming, um, or even um, deactivating it, um, on, a, um, on a decentral place and bringing it to a central place, there are many aspects that come into play, like, like browning, like uh, oxidation of the product. So therefore, I'm a bit concerned about that. So we are working on a few projects with decentralized um, yeah, processing, with drying uh, and uh, pressing. But I think that the correct way would be to have the facilities nearby that we reduce the, the transportation time. And on the other hand, if it... Uh, if there is a possibility of drying it on-site, that this would be by far the best. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yes, hello. Uh, I want to just link on, on the question of the colleague there in the back. Okay. Um, um, did you measure the, let's say, of all the lipids you squeeze out then, um, the content of um, saturated and unsaturated fatty acids um, based on the, temp on the drying temperatures, let's say, um, 60, 80, 100, 120, 140 degrees or so? Uh, we did. So I don't have the numbers in mind, but we see uh, the influence, of course, from the drying and, pr and pressing, but we see more influence coming from the substrate. So as we are all aware, BSF fat is, uh, in most of the cases, it is solid at room temperature, but based on the diets, we could also have compositions where it is um, liquid, and this is ki kind of linked to, to that um, composition. Oh, okay. I'll catch you later. Thanks. Thanks. 